My name is Bob Sherrar, and I chair the section on public health and preventive medicine at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. I'm here talking this afternoon with Dr. John Mutter, who is a professor at the Earth Institute at Columbia University and is a geophysicist. And we're here talking about global warming. Now, John, uh, the term global warming gets used a lot, but I'm sure it's much broader than that. And, and there have been considerable other changes in the weather recently. Are they all inter interconnected? Yeah. What's the impact <clears throat> on the weather? In, in fact, calling it global warming, most of people who work in the field now refer to it as climate change because it is more than just a warming. There's a lot of effects that will happen even if the temperature stays roughly the same. So <clears throat> we can expect a shift in wind patterns. We can expect the places where it rains heavily to rain even more heavily and uh, where it's dry to be even more dry. So there will be changes in the dynamics as well as in the statics. When you refer to the global average temperature, people th think of it in a sort of a static term, a simple shift, that everywhere will be a little bit warmer. That's not the case at all. Some places might be a little cooler. I see. So th this obviously will have an impact then on agriculture, things <coughs> we grow and where they're grown. Yes. So, in fact, it has a variable effect. And you have to start thinking, well, what if it got one degree warmer, two degrees, three degrees, what will happen? One relatively simple way to think of it is to say, well, the tropics will expand. That part of the Earth that's in the tropics will now be bigger. The temperate zones will move poleward to the north and south, and the polar regions will sort of get squeezed. That's one way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Most of the world's best agricultural production is in the temperate zones, like the Midwest here, Canada, you know, the places where most of the food is grown. The likelihood is that those places will shift north. Right? So if you look at calculations done on the early stages of um, getting a little warmer, you'll see that the Canadian prop models would suggest that they will benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But in sub-Saharan Africa, where agriculture is already marginal, it'll get worse. So, so basically it means then that the parts of the world that now have food sh shortages may continue to have even more severe food shortages. That's correct. Well, you know, part of the problem, John, is that in modern technology, we need energy. Mm -hmm. We need electricity to mm -hmm. operate. Yes. So what are our power sources then? Uh, what, what can we do to try to prevent global warming from getting any worse? So let's say <clears throat> we decided tomorrow to remove all fossil fuel sources. You can then ask, what are the alternates that could possibly replace what we've got? So think of a big coal-fired power plant and say, I'm going to shut that down, but I need to replace the power it's producing with something else. What's plausible? Well, energy from the sun far exceeds the energy that we use. It's about a thousand times more than we need or could ever possibly need. The problem is converting the energy from the sun to electrons, basically, and conversion efficiency isn't very good right now. The other one is nuclear, and nuclear power is capable of solving the energy problem. It deeply resisted because of the concerns about it, uh, but that's, that's possible. <clears throat> the other one, and you'd have to think about, is it possible to use fossil fuels in a clean way? So we cleaned up emissions from automobiles. We've cleaned up emissions from all sorts of things. Why can't we clean up emissions from power plants and automobiles? And there's a number of different ways to do it. There's also technologies that allow for us to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But the sources that will give us enough energy to develop, to stay developed, uh, <clears throat> nuclear, solar, and fossil. Mm -hmm. Wind, they just, it doesn't blow hard enough in enough places. Mm -hmm. And where the wind blows hard are places we don't want to live anyway. Mm -hmm. You were talking about uh, places where it rains, it may rain <clears throat> even more. Mm -hmm. uh, what about hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a somewhat complicated story. 
you've got to think about two distinct things. So let's think about the Atlantic right now, Atlantic hurricanes, where we call them hurricanes, we call them typhoons in the Pacific. So there's two things. There's <coughs> how many hurricanes will we have every hurricane season? Let's say we have 10 now. Will there be 10 in the future or 12 or 13? Whether there'll be more depends on where hurricanes come from. And they mostly come from the eastern side of the Atlantic, right off the coast of Africa. So if we're going to get more hurricanes, conditions would have to change there. The strength of a hurricane depends on the waters and the atmospheric conditions between where it forms and where it makes landfall, right? Okay. So <coughs> let's say in what most people think for the Atlantic is if there's 10 hurricanes per season now, there will probably still be 10, maybe 11, but not 15. But more of those 10 will be strong. So if right now, two out of the 10 are big guys, in the future, four out of 10 will be the big guys. I see. But there won't, probably won't be more than 10. Mm -hmm. And that's where people get a little bit mixed up about this. Yes. The, the fact is there will be more intense hurricanes, but probably not more hurricanes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, John, I also have been told that, you know, uh, global warming occurs periodically, and it's occurred periodically throughout history. Yes. Can you explain that to us? So, in the distant past, millions of years ago, we're pretty much governed by what we call orbital parameters, which means the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, which is close to circular, but it's a little bit elliptical. Mm -hmm. um, but it changes its ellipticity. It goes from being almost circular to being drawn out, to being circular and drawn out. And the period of those changes is about 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. The Earth's axis tilts off the vertical toward the plane of the ecliptic at about 22 and a half degrees. That too has changed in the past. It oscillates backwards and forwards. And the direction at which the spin axis points also goes around like a spinning top, mm -hmm. each at a different periodicity. And those change the angle at which the sun's rays hit the Earth and therefore changes the overall climate. So <coughs> we have seasons because the Earth is tilted over. If it was tilted more, we would have stronger seasonality. If it was completely up straight, it'll be fall all the time. So <laughs> it depends on those shapes and they change very slowly. The last time it was as warm as it is now was about 100,000 years ago. And before that, about 200,000 years ago. And we can trace that back for almost a million years. Mm -hmm. So the theory of um, so-called Milankovitch cycles, a guy named Milankovitch who was a Serbian astronomer proposed that this was the cause of the uh, long-term climate fluctuations. So, so 100,000 years ago, if we had global warming, then obviously it corrected itself. Yeah. I guess the question is, is there any possibility that the global warming we're seeing now may correct itself eventually? N no. Um, the argument is that there's already too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that it's going to fight the orbital forcing effects. Mm -hmm. It may, it's, it's a hard to say. I see. So um, when we think of global warming too, we think of the economic impact for yeah. uh, developing countries, but also for you know, the United States. I've heard reports of the Atlantic Ocean may come up to the you know, Philadelphia. <laughs> so what, 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 what impact will it have in our coastal regions? Yeah, well, <clears throat> We think sea level will rise. Uh, that's very simple. You know, ice will melt, go into the oceans, sea level will rise. The calculation is fairly straightforward. What will happen to our crops is less certain, and it's more governed by heat waves than the average temperature. So you only have to have a few days of extreme heat, and that will very significantly harm corn production. Mm -hmm. Even if the average temperature hasn't changed, 
If you get more bouts of extreme heat, that will ruin crops. So what we need to do is understand how much of that will happen. We'll also see <coughs> a drying up of water in places, so there won't be enough to feed crops. And a lot of industries use a lot of water too. Now, you had mentioned earlier about the uh, the poles, the Antarctic and the Arctic shrinking. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard stories of, about the polar bear, the yeah. habitat for the polar bears is disappearing. Yes. So the, the last uh, total retreat, so every year, the Arctic ice expands in the northern winter and contracts in the northern summer. It's been mm -hmm. doing it uh, for centuries. Last year, the retreat was as large as has ever been seen. So the only place that there was ice, sea ice, was in the eastern part of the Atlantic Ocean. And that's sort of the habitat for polar bears. So you'd start seeing them sort of crowded into one area on the eastern side. Mm. It's uh, just a change to their habitat. Okay. John, is there any particular thing you think we need to share with the public in terms of global warming that I might not have asked you? In, in my view, we live in a very unequal world. Yes. There are people who do very well and people who do badly. I think what will happen is as you see the temperatures slowly rise, in the very beginning, some people will win and some people will lose. And as you go further, a fewer, fewer number of people will win and more people will lose. So I think what we'll see is an exacerbation of existing inequalities. Some people will be able to manage. Mm -hmm almost no matter how bad it gets. There'll be somewhere where it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And wealthy elites and the powerful will capture that place. And the rest of us will not do so well. Because you know, we, we, we talk about the population of the world expanding. <coughs> uh, the population now being somewhere around seven billion may increase to nine billion uh, by, by the next century. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what does this mean for our children and our grandchildren? Well, most of the population increase will be in the poor world because that's where the <coughs> fertility rates are high. Lots of parts of Europe, um, absent immigration, it's going down. I think we'll live in a world in which there are more young people and fewer old people. That's the, that's the demographic in poor countries. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of out of work young people and fewer old people. It's going to create a lot of social turmoil. Exactly. So we need to stay wealthy <laughs> somehow. We need to get smart about energy. Yeah, the paradox is that the, the pathway that we took to get wealthy is one that we have to deny everybody else. Yes. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. And we don't have real solutions to that. No. Just things that you shouldn't do and a lot fewer things that you should do. Well, John, thank you very much thank for you. this uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for watching this episode of No Bones About It. Uh, I hope you found it as informative as I have. This is certainly a very interesting topic that affects us all and will affect our grandchildren as well. Thank you.